Welcome, fellow Stardust. Are you ready for a scare? I see you've come back for more. If you're new here, buckle up. And thank you all for joining me today. My name is DeRay, aka Rainbow Fright, lover of all things dark, creepy, and weird. And today I'll be discussing The Haunting, the original as well as the remake, which were adaptations of Shirley Jackson's novel titled The Haunting of Hill House. And I will be joined today by a very special returning guest. So please join me in welcoming back Terrence Maguana. Hi. Hi, DeRay. Thank you for having us back on your awesome channel. Really appreciate that. Yes, welcome back. Thank you so much for coming back. I really appreciate it. We actually did this some time ago when we talked about Suspiria, both of these Suspiria movies, the original and the remake. So I'm super excited to do it again with you with the haunting movies. But you mustn't expect every night to be Halloween. Psychic phenomena are subject to certain laws. When was the first time you saw the original Haunting? Uh, the first time I saw it was on DVD around about 2006 or something like that. I'd heard about the film for years. I became aware of it because of the White Zombie song. I don't remember the song, but they used a quote from The Haunting. Look, I know the supernatural is something that isn't supposed to happen, but it does happen. I know the supernatural is something that isn't supposed to happen, but it does happen. To me, it is the perfect ghost movie because it really is subtle and psychological and I've loved it ever since. I've watched it a considerable amount of time since. It doesn't have that effect that it did that first time because I know what's coming, I know where the surprises are, but I'm still blown away by just the look of the film, the lighting. I, I'm, I'm enchanted by the lighting. Anyway, all the angles are slightly off. There isn't a square corner in the place. I wonder it's impossible to find your way around. Add up all these these wrong angles and you get one big distortion in the house as a whole. This is a psychological experience. It might not be so scary to watch this movie, but to enjoy it as a filmmaker and aesthetically is really easy to do because it is beautiful and it's grand. And like you said, the lighting makes it that much more spooky because there isn't that much darkness a lot of times. These corners are really brightly lit in the house. So you could see everything and all its peculiarities and it makes it that much more creepy because like you said it's a ghost story but it's more messing with your head because you don't see anything you just see these characters doing this thing for some unknown reason or for a reason that we can't physically see but things are happening <laughs> people are dying in a sense this house is the ghost and is the character aside from the ones that you see on screen 1963 uh, it was common for colour films to be in production and Robert Wise and the producers made a conscious effort to shoot it in black and white and I yeah. think that really enhances the look of the film, something else, it's really gorgeous and it's, it takes me back to something that uh, Roger Ebert said about black and white is that black and white is, is like a gift because we, we don't see in black and white. So if you get a film that shows you the world in black and white, then that's something unique. That's almost like a dream state. Yeah. I agree with that. It really works with black and white. Definitely a good choice on that. Yeah, I just made it that much, that much more spooky and eerie for sure. And they got to play with the lighting more, like you mentioned before. There's one scene where she's walking away from the group and she is saying, I'm coming apart little by little, disappearing. And when she's saying those words, she's walking away and the lighting on the group is getting dimmer, but the light on her face is getting brighter. And I just love that transition um, and that focal point on her face. Julie Harris, I think her, her central performance really carries the film. I, I think in a sense that you do feel uh, isolated from her, even though uh, the other characters make a conscious effort to be friendly with her. You do feel that she's giving them the cold shoulder at every turn and I do understand that as a method actor that she was, that she did distance herself from the other cast members on yes, purpose. That was, yeah. And, and then when the production was over, she apologised for her behaviour, but it, mm -hmm. it comes across on screen, you do feel that distance, even though she's with them throughout most of the scenes. Yes. Uh, you do feel that she's kind of isolated, that 
in herself. I love that. You know, I didn't read the book and I almost wanted to try to buy it and read it before we did our recording today. But I was like, uh, we're talking about the movie, so it's fine. But I did read that she became more of an outcast in the movie and the whole psychological aspect of her like narrating the movie and her kind of sounding like she's losing it was more emphasized than it was in the book because the writers and director you know went to Shirley Jackson the writer of the novel and she was like well it's a fun idea but that's not what I intended but you can go ahead and do that in the movie so they ran with it in the movie I think that was a good choice because it you know we didn't see a lot of the ghosts on screens and her kind of losing it in the house being a character in itself made for more of a visceral experience than reading the novel one thing that also struck me, and I got this from watching the remake, someone had mentioned in a review of the remake, the Theo character is actually a lesbian. I never picked that up in either version, but when I watched The Haunting again, the 1963 version, I really did notice it this time. Oh, and, yeah. uh, oh, yes. You know, from Claire Bloom's performance as Theo. Also, I read in the original screenplay that she was meant to have, like, broke up with her her lover, who was a female, that was Robert Wise, the director, decided that's too on the nose. But it's, it's weird that they included that as part of her character from way back then, you know, 61 years ago. So I watched this movie twice in preparation for this chat. And the first time, like you said, I did not pick up on the fact that anybody was gay or attracted to the same sex and then I did some research on the film and I went back and watched it again I'm like how did I miss all of these signs and it's crazy just how forward it really is because in the book and the novel apparently she is Theo is in fact um, a lesbian but they really have to tone it down for the 1960s movie and really try to not let them touch too much even when they are scared together that was almost too much for producers and to see them even do what they did now that I it's registering it's still pretty pretty ballsy <laughs> to do what what they did and little lines that Theo has you know, because they talk about companions in the movie. Companion is like a, a, a theme in the movie. And Theo has this line where she says to uh, Eleanor, oh, excellent, to my new companion. Excellent. My new companion. Another line is, oh, we, we, have a, we have a date for breakfast then. And I'm like, oh, okay, she's over there trying to make the moves on now, and she is just not picking up what she is putting down. That's anyhow. We have a date for breakfast. Good night, Theo. Luke's character was a lot of fun. He, after the second watch, it was clear that he's just an alcoholic. He's usually awake when the women are in bed drinking and, you know, he's risking his life and other people's lives just to drink sometimes. And so it was kind of funny just realizing that, yeah, he's just a bit of an alcoholic. And it was, it was subtle the way they presented that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do love that actor, Russ Tamblin. I, I first became aware of him from a film called Tom Thumb that I used to love as a child. And uh, he was also in Robert Wise's other film, West Side Story, as well. So he's a oh, yeah. great physical actor, the dancer. I love that whole part where he jumps off the staircase, <laughs> when he goes on the staircase <laughs> for the first time and then he jumps off. And I was like, so that's dramatic. him doing that. There's no stunt man <laughs> doing that. I know that for a fact. But yeah, 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 he's terrific. I also saw that he didn't want to play this role at first because it was kind of a jerk character. So he basically declined the first offer, but then the studio was like, we strongly suggest that you reconsider, otherwise we'll end your contract. He's like, okay, maybe I'll go ahead and play Luke. And then he ended up saying that it was one of his favorite roles, but who's to say if that's true or if he was just saying that to appease the studio, but. Go back to him being an alcoholic when they find out that the, <laughs> <laughs> when they find out that there's this cold breeze coming from nowhere. He's like, "Oh, great! Somewhere I can chill my beer." <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> you know, night. Just the uh, place to chill our beer, huh? No, no, don't go in there. Well, I'm with Dr. Marrow's group. I'm supposed to see Mrs. Dudley. Is she here? What do you think? 
yeah, so I really thought I was gonna really dislike this movie upon my rewatch of it, but I don't hate it. For me, I think I really was enjoying the first 30 minutes as a remake with coming from 63 to 99 and then revamping it a little bit. But at around the 30 minute mark, they really started to take those really hard left turns that made me feel like, okay, you really just changed the whole story and it's not the original anymore. It's a completely different story. I, I didn't like the fact that we basically didn't have um, the house as a character haunting the people instead it was Hugh Crane who is the ghost that is haunting Eleanor and everybody else keeping captive these children that Eleanor is throughout the film trying to rescue and so it's a fun story you know when you step back from it but it's just not the haunting it's not Shirley Jackson's story. I, I took an instant dislike to it uh, upon its release because I just didn't like the, the CGI look of it I remember seeing the trailer for it and I at that time, I still hadn't seen the the Robert Wise version. Uh, as years went on and I'd seen the Robert Wise version, I, I immediately went, right, I'm never going to watch that 90s one because it got absolutely panned. It did okay, but it did okay at the box office, but it got panned by the critics at the time. So, and I'm one of these sort of sheep that just believes everything the critics say at that <laughs> time anyway. Uh, so I, I just ignored that and I watched it only for this. Uh, jam session and uh, I, I was surprised I didn't dislike I, I, I have issues with it I don't hate it I don't think the film is boring that's that to me that's the biggest offense a movie can make is be boring right <laughs> yeah. besides being offensive of course <laughs> right the thing is I felt the film tied itself on in knots unnecessarily the whole oh, yeah. concept of which I think was okay or you probably looks good on paper that these people are brought to this house not knowing that it's haunted. That they're told that they're there for some sleep deprivation experiment. Which is fair enough, because if you're going to go and spend the night in a haunted house, you would think, yeah, best that you didn't know it was haunted, because then every, every apparition or thing that you see is definitely not psychological, because you might see things that people put the idea in your head that this place is haunted. My, my, my issue was that Liam Neeson's character, Dr. Marrow, I think he's called in this one, he uh, he has this fear, he's doing this fear experiment in secret to these people, but it's never really made clear what it is. <laughs> We're not yeah. really let in on what this experiment really entails. Obviously, he's going to get found out at some point, and when that moment does happen, it just sort of disappears like vapor. It's just like, why bother, <laughs> right? With the original, it was more simplistic to have uh, Dr. Markway who he's the stand-in for, who's simply on their side. He's like, look, we're doing this experiment, trying to prove the ghosts exist. Whereas in this one, it gets so convoluted unnecessarily. And I feel yes. that that, you know, I felt that that kind of hurt it in some way. I gave you the clues. You created the story as you were meant to. But it's over, I'm pulling the plug. But also, um, the weird thing is, is it kind of, it did set up that there was going to be some violence when you had the moment with the harpsichord the wire from the harpsichord slashes the woman's face as assistant. And I was like, oh goodness, this is going to be more violent. Haunting's not really a violent movie, but this one, straight away, we get a big slash down the face. I'm like, okay, they're going to go there. And, and yeah, it, it does go there a little bit, not to the not to the degree I was kind of hoping for. You really only get one other moment when um, Luke's character is beheaded. Um, so it is kind of a letdown to just have those two things go down when you have all this CGI and fantastical things going on just to kind of make it in between. Either don't do it at all like the original or go all out. But again, they wanted to keep the PG-13 rating, which I really hate hearing that kind of shit. Like, oh, it would have been more this, but because of the PG-13 rating, we had to go this way. I feel that this film is kind of going in two directions at the one time, that it wants to be this grand, special effects spectacular and it's it's in it's in the set design really extreme and it's scale and just this bizarre design and i'm fine with that i'm like okay they're gonna go all out crazy 
and but at the same time they want to have their sort of subtle cake and they want to have their special effects spectacular at the same time and yeah. i think that's kind of detrimental it's still entertaining though it's still a fun watch uh, lily yeah. taylor is an actor that i really like ever since I've seen her in say anything where she played corey and she's still a very busy actor she's still still around right doing lots of great work and yeah. i like her take on eleanor i think she made eleanor a little bit more relatable than Julie Harris. Yeah. Julie Harris made her more distant and crazed, whereas I felt that Lily Taylor made her more relatable to younger audiences, mainstream audiences. I like this house. I think it's a beautiful house. Yeah, I guess. Jan de Bont, I mean, he's only ever directed five films in his, in his life. He's now retired now, he's 80 years old. And at that time, he was a veteran cinematographer for over 20 years. Uh, he'd been working with, originally with Paul Verhoeven, because he's Dutch, he's from Holland. And uh, his career is, is spectacular. He, he was one of the, <laughs> you've heard of the film Roar, with uh, the, where they use live animals and they, they attack their cast and crew. I'm sure you've heard of this film from the early 80s. <laughs> Look that up. <laughs> but he actually got 230 stitches in his head because some oh. tiger like mauled him. He was the cinematographer on that movie. And, you know, he, I think The Haunting was a bit of a comeback for him to an extent because he just had a big major flop with Speed 2 Cruise Control, which was like his third directorial movie, sequel to his original film, Speed. Yes. And, it, and you think about it, yeah, The Haunting, it, it did do good business, but you can kind of feel that uh, Jan de Bont was kind of just put there. Not saying he's a bad yeah. director or anything, but you can feel that Spielberg, it's kind of, he was really in charge again. Not to not to bring up that ghost of the <laughs> ghost of the poltergeist uh, sort of myth. Where Situation. Said, yeah, yeah, Toby Hooper didn't direct it and all that kind of thing. But you do feel that, you do feel that Spielberg's kind of uh, get a hand in it yeah because you think about you think about twister you think about speed you think about speed too like none of those you could really compare to the haunting and yes it's a director can make completely different movies um but you could just feel the spielbergness in this one compared to those three movies yeah in particular as well with jerry goldsmith returning you know that was he was the composer on poltergeist as well and uh, i like his score for the haunting and this was the final one that he ever did for spielberg apparently yeah. and and it does it does feel like a spielberg movie especially with the you know when you compare it to the if you're going to compare it to the original haunting the sequence that's really famous where eleanor is running down corridor and then she stops at the mirror and all that stuff and she's freaking out and this one he's bolting down the corridor and everything's like shaking i mean she may, they may as well be playing the indiana jones music <laughs> during those scenes right <laughs> it feels that way based on our last discussion about the suspiria uh films right i think they they're like that in a sense they're two different types of movies they've got different goals this movie is there to be a summer blockbuster popcorn film, the 1999 version. Robert Wise, in, in 1963, he's out to really scare people, right? In a, in a very psychological way. And from what I've read, people were terrified of The Haunting. Martin Scorsese heralds it as one of the best horror films of all time. And yeah. I, I don't disagree with anyone that says, that's not scary. That film isn't scary, that's boring, whatever. Because it's it's in that same league as the Blair Witch Project and films like that, where it's psychological, it's not going to terrify you like uh, Jason Voorhees or Leatherface. It can't be compared to films like that. It is a psychological horror, and the 1999 remake is is it's all about running and chasing and things popping out and you know it's CGI at, at that time. I can imagine was quite dazzling, it's not now. It's hard to get scared of a big fists coming through a wall, right? Honestly, the breathing door in the original was more 
frightening than that face going through the yeah. new door. So yes, probably take and, half a day to shoot. <laughs> yes, and just for fun, what would you pick? Uh, the haunting original or House on Haunted Hill original? Uh, the haunting. Okay. Easily. Yeah, yeah. The haunting is my number one ghost movie, so it's hard oh, to beat. Oh, okay. I yeah. didn't know that. No, exactly, and uh, you know, probably after that it's Poltergeist. Terrence, I so appreciate your time. This has been such a fun discussion, and I look forward to doing another one of these with you in the very near future. Oh, terrific, Deray. I've had such a lovely time. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. All right, y'all. Until next time, peace. Okay.